and we are officially live. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our esteemed table of nights, our lovely producer, Vespa, and of course, to you, our audience. I'm Dr. Jessica Lee, and I'm here to today. My first daily round of interviews are trying to address that feeling of disconnection. I should very Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and switch over just to say hello to everybody and give a little brief rundown. Um, we are definitely taking questions from the audience. So you viewers, as things pop up, go ahead and feel free to just jump in, put them in the comment box. I'm going to keep an eye on it, but otherwise I'm going to stay out of the way. And as things um, open up and we have a moment to address the questions, then we will do that. Uh, because we're on limited time frame, we might not be able to get to everybody's questions. So if we are unable to get to your questions, worry not. We will do our best in the future episodes to make sure to plug them in where we can. Um, but otherwise, do not take it personally. It is not a personal choice. Uh, we just can't get to everybody. All right. Um, for now, I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to our hostess and we are going to get started. So here we go. Let's see. Awesome. Thanks, Vespa. You're welcome. Uh, so I strongly believe in the mantra if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, and also, if not me, who? If not now, when? So, let's get started um, with Sir Alfin. Hi there. So, our first question is just some background questions. Uh, I'm Alfin. Uh, I'm currently 52 years old. I was knighted when I was 48. I'm in the Kingdom of Eldamere uh, in my main weapon form in tourney is sword and shield. In melee, I'll fight either shield or spear. Uh, but my big thing in, in melee is field commanding as opposed to combat directly. I started in the SCA in 1991, and I've been fighting since the get-go. Uh, knighted in 2016, so 25 years in. And uh, my uh, thing that I love about fighting is in a really great fight, you get sort of this flow between you and your opponent. And I just love that feeling of connection. So I'm Elizabeth Mortimer. I'm in Eldermir also, which is Ontario, Canada. I'm a sword and shield fighter and I'm a melee and a war fighter. I love melees and I love wars. I've been in the SCA since September, 1986. And I've been fighting since the end of 86, maybe the beginning of 1987. I was fighting for nine years before I was elevated. And I fight because I find it's an exhilarating challenge of mind and body and nothing else makes me feel like that. Hi, I'm Sir Cara, Sir Arya Cara. I'm from Kai. Um, I primarily fight sword and shield and I've been fighting for going on 10 years. Um, I'm one of the newest knights um, in Kaid, and um, it was nine years before I was elevated. Uh, my favorite part about fighting is also war. I love that you get to fight with your friends and you get to fight against your friends, and then you get to go hang out around a campfire later on. So that would be my favorite part. <sighs> Hold on one sec. There. Um, I'm Sir Roisin. I'm from North Shield. Um, I'm currently 48, which is crazy. Um, mostly I fight sword and oval shield with a center grip. I started fighting in 1999 or maybe 1998. I'm not sure. I joined to continue fencing because I loved fencing in college. And so in one way, I've been fighting since I, before I even joined the SCA. Um, 
I moved to North Shield, which is a principality in the year 2000. And I started fighting heavy in 2001. So I've been fighting heavy about 19 years. I was knighted in 2008. And so that took me about eight years, but I think that's really misleading because it's, it's a lot more about quality time and helmet than years. Um, I love the competition and the physical exertion of fighting, and I love the mental chess game, mostly. Hi, I'm uh, Sir Eva von Danzig from the Kingdom of Lokak, which is located in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I'm currently 31 years old. Uh, my main weapons form is sword and shield. I dabble with a little bit of sword and buckler. I love everything fighting, so I love tournament and war. Um, I joined the SEA when I was 12 years old because my parents were really involved. And at first I wasn't really, but then it really obviously grew on me. Uh, I've been fighting since I was 16. So I got authorized pretty much as soon as I could. Um, and I was knighted five years ago. I was the first woman knighted in the Kingdom of Lockup. Uh, and really what I love about fighting, very similar to Elflin, is the connection and that moment of, of, of flow and just being in the right place and being able to accept the openings that your opponent offers you and just having, being the right place at the right time. Excellent. Thanks for the introductions, everyone. Uh, so we're going to kick off with our first question, which is, why did you want to be a knight? And so we have um, Sir Elizabeth going first. Uh, so I always wondered why you wouldn't be a knight, even though I didn't know what a knight <laughs> was when I first joined. I thought it would be a wonderful thing to be. So I have just always wanted to be one. Um, I also always wanted to be a knight. I joined when I was 16, and those were the people I looked up to. Um, I admired their chivalry, their prowess on the field. So, um, yeah, it's been a dream come true. So I fell in love with fighting, but I saw the goal of knighthood as totally out of my control and, and totally unrealistic. Um, I, I really thought it was a subjective decision made by a bunch of really amazing fighters who were not really much like me. So, but I found that if I fought better, I had more fun fighting. So I really wanted to keep fighting better and better and better. And if I had to have a goal, I decided that my goal would be winning crown because I felt like I had some sort of control over that. Um, but I, I never really said, I'm going to be a knight. Uh, how about you, Sareva? Uh, so for me, I mean, I really looked up to a lot of the, the pinnacles of the art and I wanted to be like them. So, I mean, knighthood was always an aspiration for me. Um, at first it was largely about the fighting and then uh, shortly before I became a knight, there was the extra layers of being a pinnacle of chivalry and wanting to uphold those traditions. Um, but mostly it was, you know, I had so many good role models and I would, you know, look at, at different knights from different kingdoms and I just wanted to be able to be a part of that and to emulate that. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of like best there. Uh, I'm a history buff. So when I came into the society and looking at medieval history, the first thing you always think about is knights on armor and on horseback and, and the whole concept of the the theory or the the myth of chivalry. Uh, once I'd been in the society for a while and I had started fighting, I kind of I just wanted to be able to prove to myself that I could do it. It was uh, not so much that I could be a knight as I could be good enough to be a knight, sort of that bar. All right. So the next question we've got is how would you describe your path to knighthood? So I started out as a heavy fighter ever since day one when somebody told me that I could hold the sword and shield and hit the guy across from me. Um, but as I got further along in my path, I became a squire to Alexander and I got closer to knighthood. I realized how important all the other aspects were, like 
I had to get delve deeper into sewing and to armoring so that I could look the part. I had to be more social so you can really get to know the other people that are going to be in your brotherhood, um, which was definitely the hardest part because I am totally an introvert. Um, but I had to also make sure that people were seeing me when I served in my kingdom. So once I did those things and I really put the effort in, I kept traveling and fighting until um, the Knights voted me in. I would describe my path as fun, um, really frustrating and hard work and extremely time consuming, but super fun. And it doesn't stop with being a knight, being knighted. Um, it's, yeah, that's about all I can say. It's, it's super frustrating and super hard and really, really fun. Uh, so for me, I feel like I had uh, an interesting path. I, because I started so young, uh, it really became part of my lifestyle. Um, but I often tell a lot of our students uh, that if I could get knighted, anybody could, because I started super young. Um, I was unathletic. I really didn't have any natural talent. Um, but I got knighted in nine and a half years, which it, the average for our kingdom is about 10. Um, but for me, like when I first started fighting, I struggled to generate power. So that was really my first uh, hurdle was really cementing down my basic technique to really make sure that I could uh, I could hit with enough power. And um, I, I didn't authorize on my first go because I couldn't hit anybody hard enough. So um, that was like my first little little hurdle was was being able to really fight even effectively on the base level. So ever since then, it was just nailing down the technique and working as hard as I could. But it was a joyful process because uh, my partner and I, the group that we live in had no nights. Uh, so we are in a small barony in the South of Australia. And uh, my fiance is actually the first person knighted in this group in 23 years. And I was the next after him. Um, so we really had to travel to find influence and that meant that we, you know, met as many people and fought as many people as we could and we traveled to other kingdoms to meet and to learn and that was really joyful. Um, I was also squired three different times so that is uh, another kind of fun issue in itself but um, I eventually met my knight Sir Mark de Arendelle who really guided the path that I was on and helped me to cement my own style, which really, you know, kind of gave me that last push into being the most effective fighter that I could be at the time. And I've been working on that ever since. Um, so when I read this question, honestly, the first word that came to mind was torturous. It was a lot of up and down in my path. There was a certain amount of politics got involved, which kind of affects your fun of things. And to be honest, there were times when I just, I just felt I was done. And I think the, where I hit bottom, I was sitting at a crown tourney. And the only reason I fought it is because it was in our local group and it was a round robin. I had my last fight to go. Um, I was sitting there and I was looking at the list field and I was thinking, this is my last fight ever. I'm never going to put on armor again. And one of our dukes came over and he was totally oblivious to where my mindset was. And he just came over and he sat down and he says, oh, you've been fighting so well today. I'm so proud. This is so great. And you know, I'd love to see you on the field. And it made me change my mindset a little bit and kind of reset and think about what I really wanted out of this journey. And uh, so I thought, yeah, okay, I'll give it another shot. And here I am. When I first heard about fighting, it was a really long time ago. <laughs> and women were not really common in fighting, but I phoned the local contact and I said, hey, I've heard about this thing called the SCA. And he was describing it to him and he described the fighting. And I said, well, can women fight? And he said, well, they can, but they don't usually. And I said, but there's no rule against it. And he said, nope, there's no rule against it. And from that moment on, I was fighting. And I fought because I wanted to be good. I fought because it made me happy. I practiced all the time. And I want to stress rather whether or not I had become a knight, I would have continued fighting. 
Uh, I was lucky enough to have a really good group of friends. We were traveling all the time. We, we went to events all over. Eldermere was part of the Middle Kingdom at the time. And uh, I know one year we were away 47 weekends out of the year and it was just so much fun. But after a while, it got kind of stressful and uh, I would get tense and I wasn't having any fun anymore. So I just decided, as Alfwin said, I would stand back and I would just go to events and just have fun, just do pickups. And I guess you could say I, I got my groove back. And shortly after I got my groove back, that's when, that's when I was actually elevated. And it was, it was a, a nice thing. All right. So the next question um, comes from Yaskona Hala in Lockhart. And so her question for the panel is, what was the best tip and the worst tip that you received as a squire? So the best tip I've ever, ever heard, and I repeat it often, is hit them all and make them like it. And making them like it is actually the more important part of that half of that saying is hit them all and make them like it. Um, so the worst advice I got, um, so there's an event and there's some pickup fights after and pretty much there weren't very many. So it was me and this guy. And I looked at him and I'm like, I know there's nothing I can do to win this fight. I am not going to win, but I'm pretty sure I can learn something because he's really good. So go for it. So I went out there, we did a couple passes. He hit me, he hit me, whatever. Um, I go in and I land this flat snap. And then I got out because I didn't want to get hit. And he stopped and he kind of blinked and he kind of looked. And he came back in and we kept fighting. And I'm like, yeah, I knew I couldn't hit him, whatever. Um, so after the fight, we're, we're kind of talking and he's like, so you hit me and it was clean and it was hard, but I looked at your facial expression and your face told me you didn't believe in it. So it couldn't have been good. And I was like, you just called off a shot for poor facial expression. So that's terrible advice. A person shouldn't have to worry about their facial expression. On the other hand, it kind of leads into some good advice because to win a fight, you actually have to do more than hit some with someone. You have to make them believe that you bested them. And it's, it's actually two different things. So I guess that's, that's the worst advice, poor facial expression. All right, so just to clarify first, uh, I was a squire briefly, it didn't work out. Um, and I went to, instead of taking another red belt, I went the apprentice route and I was actually laureled in 2003. So I spent a lot of my path as a peer in my own right, which has colored how I approached uh, being a knight. Um, so the best tip I think I ever got, I was traveling back from an event with one of our local knights and he turned to me and he said, what did you learn today? And I kind of mumbled a couple things, but my takeaway was more of, I need to ask that question more often. And he used to keep a journal. So I started keeping a journal as well. And I dug them out. I actually have seven of them now. Um, and it hasn't been continuous. Sometimes I go away and I come back, uh, but it was, really helpful to get my thoughts in order. When somebody gave me a bit of advice, I could write it down uh, and I could think about it later. I have a really bad short-term memory, so I have to keep track of these things. And every now and again, I go back through the old books and I say, oh, I see this and I see that. And, and it kind of helps me pull everything back together. Uh, the worst advice is it's, it's a combination of things because fighting is both mental and physical. So you have strengths and weaknesses in both and any advice you get, if it's not in your combination of strengths and weaknesses, it's not going to be very helpful. So if people give me advice that really doesn't apply to somebody who's five foot six and 50 years old and 160 pounds, it's not going to help me much. So when I have some big super duke tell me, oh yeah, yeah, first thing you do is throw this biggest, hardest shot you got right into his shield and make them know you, you mean business, that's not gonna help me very much. So I would actually tailor that question to anything that 
is obviously not going to help somebody. So if you're five foot one and your and your advice is throw more scorpions, not a good advice. Um, so one of the best tips that I ever got was from my knight Alexander. Um, when we started getting closer to I started getting closer to knighthood, we would analyze fights after attorney, and um, I had so much pressure to win every fight, and all of that was self-imposed. I would see. Um, people there I was trying to impress and I thought that well, the only way I could be a knight is by winning every fight and so um, the best advice that he gave me is to stop stressing and to go have fun like we, we do this for a reason we love to fight and um, so I, I really I took the stress off myself and I went and I had fun and I got knighted so um, that made my performance better um, everybody was having fun on the field and um, yeah a lot less stress involved and the worst tip is one that I got several times throughout my, once I got squired throughout my path to knighthood, um, is uh, they would talk about me and knights council and then somebody, um, they would designate somebody to come talk to me and just like catch me up with, oh, this is what you should do. And I kept hearing the phrase, uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, the first time I heard that, I just kept doing what I was doing. The second time I heard that, I just kept doing what I was doing. The third time I heard that, I had had enough. So I actually, I stopped and I said, I need to know what I need to do better because there's something that's not working here. So give me specifics instead of like feeling disheartened and frustrated with just keep doing what you're doing. Can you tell me um, specifics? So I would encourage you if you ever have somebody come up and tell you that, just keep doing what you're doing. Ask for those specifics. Some interesting tips in there. All right, so the next question we've got from Fianola Ian Umerda. It's an interesting question. It's, did you ever feel that the likelihood of you getting knighted was much lower than that of every other guy at fighter practice? And if so, how did you deal with those feelings and overcome them? So I have to say that I didn't think my chances of being knighted were lower than any other guy at fight practice. But there was a cohort when I was coming up, the unbelts. And of the unbelts, sometimes I would get frustrated because some of them got knighted uh, before I do. Um, but I think that I never thought it wasn't possible. I think that at the time, I just thought it was gonna take a really long time I was okay with that because I really, really like challenges, but I never thought that it would not be possible. I know where this question comes from and I know the people at the local practice that you've got and you've got a phenomenal group of fighters there. And I would say that with that group of fighters, it would be hard not to possibly to be, discouraged isn't the wrong word, but to be questioning whether you could or not because they are such a phenomenal group of fighters. I would encourage you to, to be confident in yourself and to keep practicing and going with them. And I know that you guys talk a lot. So talk and ask and keep practicing. You guys have got a great group and you'll be fantastic. So like I said earlier, uh, the group that I was in had no active nights for a really long time. Uh, so for me, I never really questioned whether or not it was possible or likely that I would be elevated. I was always, encouraged uh, just as much or, or sometimes a lot more than the guys around me. Um, and, and honestly, it's a point at which I never doubted that I would get there. Um, and I was told a lot of the time that, you know, everyone's path is different. So even if it takes you a little bit longer, it doesn't diminish your path. It's just the amount of time it'll take you to get there. So for me, I really uh, would look around at other fighters in the kingdom, uh, male fighters, and go, well, you know, their path is a little bit faster, but they're also in a group that has more representation. They get to learn more often and train with more people. So it, it didn't feel like a gender bias thing to me. It just felt like, you know, I just have to put the work in. And that's kind of the advice I would give anybody is just keep training hard and make yourself undeniable if you feel that way. 
we are going to take just a little interlude for everybody that is watching. We have a question from the audience. Um, the question would be, what was the biggest hurdle you dealt with in your path? Now we are just going to kind of look to all of you. So if you're interested in answering this, go ahead and give me a hand. All right, I'm going <laughs> to I'm just going to start from the top and move on down. So Sir Eva, we'll start with you. All right. And there we go. I feel like I jumped the queue. <laughs> no, no, you're, well, it might have displayed differently for all of us. <laughs> uh, so for me, it's interesting because I know quite a common conception is that, uh, you know, women have so many hurdles to overcome and it's harder for us. For me per personally, in my path, the hurdle that was greatest for me to overcome was actually uh, the sense of pressure that was kind of placed upon me by people who were well-wishers because even though uh, people feel like there would be a lot of adversity for female combatants, honestly, I had so many people giving me a little bit too much extra attention all of the time. It made me feel like my path wasn't just about me, it was about them and their agenda, you know, because uh, I had people after I was elevated come up and go, about effing time. And they weren't talking about me. They were talking about a woman in general. And I sort of went, thanks. But certainly before the time I was elevated, uh, I, I would get extra praise heaped onto me at a time that, you know, perhaps I, you know, bummed out of a tournament in two and I knew I didn't fight well, but I would instantly have five people come up and go, your fighting was so great today, but I knew it wasn't great. Um, but something that my knight had said to me is you can't control uh, what people are inspired by. You can't control how people think of you. So you kind of just have to take that in your stride and, and be okay with it and don't feel the sense of pressure because in the end they want well for you and that is a good thing. And so it really was something that I had to overcome and go, it's okay. People just want what's best for me. Uh, any extra political agenda, has nothing to do with me. I just have to enjoy fighting. And that that really was the last step towards um, finding a way forward in my fighting. Thank you. Sir Elizabeth, I believe you had wanted to answer this question as well. So fighting is fun. Winning is more fun. But for a long time, when I won, I felt like a bad guy. Like, yay, I won. And the other person would be really sad. And I'd be like, wow, I really made them sad because I beat them. And it took me a while to realize that I was feeling guilty winning, even though somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. And overcoming the sense of um, hurting somebody or making somebody sad when I won was a tough one for me. And it took me a little while to realize that that's what my experiences are or were when I, when I was winning. And uh, it sounds kind of goofy now, but uh, maybe it's the Canadian side of me. What can I say? But that was something really that I had to overcome. Uh, if I gave them a really good fight and I lost, I'd be like, yeah, I gave them a great fight. And they're happy. So it took a, it took a while for me to remember that winning is okay. Good people could win too. <laughs> All right, I'm switching back over to take a look at all of you lovely faces. Do we have any more answers for that particular question? Great, I'm spotlighting you now. All right, um, probably my biggest issue was isolation. Uh, I'm in a canton that's a fair distance from any other groups, so I. Other, other people in the kingdom can hit two, three, four practices a week fairly easily. I don't have that option, so it was hard to get that kind of training. And also not having a household or a dedicated knight who was, to say, responsible for training me meant that I had to go out and find somebody and say, hey, can you teach me something today? So I found that really hard to try to break through those barriers uh, that other people just didn't even see because it was natural for them. Wonderful. And any other comments before we move back on to the rest of the episode? All right, I am surrendering to our lovely hostess. Thank you. All right, so the next question. So this is from Baroness uh, Ilan Donata of the Mid Realm. 
And that's how did you manage or overcome fears that you might never reach your goals, no matter how hard or long you work? Um, so I don't, I guess I would speak to frustration um, that I wasn't getting anywhere towards my goals. I, I don't think I ever really feared that I wouldn't achieve. I mean, I just figured I was, I was going and I loved fighting. So as long as it took whatever. Um, and, but when I got frustrated, that would make me stop and, and break things down into steps and, you know, kind of be like, oh, so right now I am really frustrated. What can I do right now? Should I do my laundry so you know I'm ready for fight practice with clean armor, repaired armor, whatever? Um, should I go out and do pal work? Should I watch some videos? Um, and maybe that means I need to think about my victory conditions in a fight. Maybe I need to think about you know next practice, I'm going to throw a wrap shot. I'm going to throw a, a double tap wrap shot. You know maybe I'm going to I'm going to figure out something that when I do it, I can tell myself I succeeded. Because if it's all, gee, I lost that fight, I'm discouraged. I lost this fight, I'm discouraged. Then yeah, you're totally discouraged all the time. And that makes people give up. So get your victory conditions in order so that you can achieve small goals as you step towards whatever your biggest goal is. Um. So you'd heard earlier about uh, talking to the knights and asking, what do I need to do? And them feet telling you, nope, you're doing great. Just keep what you're doing. I had the same thing. I had said the same thing for years. And yeah, it was very frustrating to have them tell me, no, you're doing great. And then go to the meeting and vote no. Um, so if you're voting no, you got to have a reason. Tell me what that reason is. And that was part of my frustration that effectively made me give up on getting knighted. So I guess the short answer to your question was I changed my goal. So instead of trying to make myself into the sort of person that gets knighted, I took a good hard look at who I was and what kind of fighter I wanted to be and worked towards that. And if that proved to be good enough for the order, then great. But it made me change my focus and I was much better off for it in the long run, to be honest. Well, thanks for that. All right, so this next question is from Jean Todd. I'm just going to quickly mention as well that I didn't write these questions. I generally cut and copy what we got. So um, I guess some of the attitude that's coming through isn't necessarily our attitude, um, but I'm trying to be faithful to the way the questions are phrased. So with that in mind, the next question is, why do you fight? It seems to me that everything is four times harder for females in SEA fighting. What do you gain or what is the advantage in you continuing to fight? So for me, I fight because I love fighting. Uh, I truly believe that if you love fighting, the path is the reward. But if you fight purely because you wanna reach an accolade, then the path will be a burden and you'll be disappointed when you get there. Um, I don't necessarily, I don't agree that things are four times harder for women. I think our sport can be more difficult or challenging for people of small physiques overall. Uh, and so sometimes you have to put in the extra work to get your technique just right, but you can ultimately be successful with hard work. Um, so yeah, I love it. That's it. That's the advantage for me. So I'm, I would echo the same thing. Fighting to me, it makes me happy in a way that nothing else makes me happy. And at five foot four, I can't say that I know what it's like to be a big, tall guy. I don't know if it's four times harder for women. I don't know what it's like to be a small guy. I do know it's a sport that favors big, tall guys. So I'll just leave it at that. If the question is, why do you fight and what do you get from it? If the question is, do I get try to get better every practice, then yes. One of the things I like about fighting is that it's hard. I like that it's it's a challenge. I like that it's difficult. I like that it's a mind-body sort of joining together thing. I like that when it finally all comes together, it's perfect. And uh, I, I like it when it comes like that. So, and I like the challenge. So that's why I fight. All right, so the next one we've got is, what do you, oh, sorry, this is from Kenny. What do you think was different for you as a female than what it's like for males on your path to being a knight? 
So um, I think mostly at the beginning is where I saw the discrepancy between um, female and male. Um, and I, I don't know if that was only because I was female or if it was also because I was young. Um, because it's not particularly intimidating at the beginning of a fight. I used to have to declare my age to anybody I fought. That's how that would start. And then we would get to fight if they agreed to it. Um, but I really had to focus on technique um, because the muscle strength wasn't there. So it was a slow road at the beginning. But once I got my aggression, that was my first tactic was to get a lot of aggression in. Um, and then really hone in that technique so that um, you're using your hips, you're using... Um, uh the sorry <laughs> that you're using your hips and you're using your technique to win fights um so i didn't have that problem at the end of my journey so something that was kind of spoken of earlier um i thought it was really hard for me because i got so much attention a lot of the time and and sometimes that was really good because I would get advice whether I asked for it or not after every fight with whoever I fought. And so I would literally write it down in a book pretty much after every three, four fights, as long as I thought I could remember and then write it down. And I would take that to my night and I'd be like, okay, earn your keep, dude. Here's all this stuff I got from this event and what's worth something and what should I just forget about? Cause you know, it was dumb or whatever. Um, so in some ways that was really valuable to me. And I'm not sure guys get that quite as much. Um, on the other hand, it, it put a lot of pressure on me because I really felt like everyone was watching me all the time. And, you know, especially as I got better and better, I would get asked, why aren't you knighted yet? And I'm like, uh, well, sir, you probably know more about that than I do, you know? And, and the populace too would, would, you know, be like, you represent all the women and all of our dreams. And I'd be like, what if I totally miss a shot and don't call it? And, you know, I'm a complete failure. So I guess in some ways that was okay because it, it taught me that I could give myself permission to disappoint people. But in other ways, I mean, it was really hard for a long time. All right, the next one we've got is from Sydney in Atlantia, and she says, how did you know when you were getting close to being knighted, and what was the last part of your journey to knighthood like? Uh, well, as I mentioned, I had given up on, uh, on being knighted, so uh, when I was, it was pretty much a surprise. I had no real expectations. Um, I had switched my concentration to fighting in Crown, um, so the last part of my journey really was honestly, physically and mentally exhausting because uh, I was really concentrating on my physical training. I was in the gym twice a day. I was doing cardio twice a day. I was doing all kinds of study on the mental game. I was traveling all over trying to get whatever practice time in that I could. And that paid off because I started making the, the semifinals in crown, not always, but semi-regularly. So... I was feeling good about myself in that respect. Um, so I, I, uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so I think that I noticed that I was getting towards the end of my journey when knights would come up and stop talking to me and I'd be like, how do you even know who I am? Like, like, I'm just best. Why are you talking to me? So that part was a little bit of a surprise. Um, people I didn't know were coming up to me. And then it's been said elsewhere. I did. I felt tons and tons of pressure, like stand up. You, you have to stand up for all women fighters everywhere and be perfect all the time. And it was too much. And, and it was really hard. And uh, that's when I started going to events, as I mentioned earlier, and just going for fun again. I wasn't fighting in the tournaments. I wasn't you know, trying to shine in any way. I just went for fun. And I'd be doing my pickups outside, say, and people would come and fight with me. And my fighting really started to, to flow. I, it worked very well for me. And as I lost the stress and the strain and found the joy again, that's what, um, I think that's what showed that I was a good enough fighter, that I had whatever they were looking for. 
which is always something people ask. Um, I had a lot of fun um, when I when I knew I was getting close. It was about a year before I got knighted, and um, I had a lot of friends that were already knights, and we started having these weird fights where they were extremely motivational and like, oh, I can see how much you've improved since the last time I fought you, which honestly was probably a couple weeks prior. Um, but the fights were getting a lot more intense. I was getting a lot of intensity from them. And at the end, I would get, we'd hug each other like normal. And then they would kind of nod and they'd look at me and they'd nod. I'm like nodding back. It's kind of weird. But I think that was them really like testing me um, to see, am I ready? as my fighting prowess there. So um, it was fun because we were already friends. Um, a little weird because they were treating me a little bit different, but um, that last year I was getting great fights. Um, I fought every night I could find. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, I don't know, I kind of did because, I mean, I kind of recognized I was getting close because I recognized I was fighting really well but I kind of didn't because I was mostly focused on fighting and teaching and, and doing the thing. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure I really knew that I was getting closer other than I did recognize I was fighting better. Uh, so similar here, honestly, at the time that I was put on vigil, I had no clue, but Honestly, that was probably because uh, for me in my kingdom, like I'd spent five years with uh, knights literally pulling chairs to the side of the field to watch me fight. And so there was this sense of, I knew that I was being looked at and talked about for years before I was finally put on vigil. But that last part of my fighting career was really like, I'd uh, gotten squared to Sir Mark. I was uh, corresponding from the West Kingdom to, to Loch Ark and he was sort of giving me suggestions on how to tweak my fighting. And that was all coming together. So I would have really good intense fight with, fights with my knights around the kingdom locally. Um, and even if I wasn't necessarily winning them all, I was giving them all a really good fight. Um, so I was enjoying that. And to be honest, at the time that I was put on vigil, I was really actually happy just being a squire and, and learning. So uh, for me, that last part was actually a real surprise when I was put on vigil. So it's different for everybody. <laughs> that's a wonderful, wonderful answer. Um, in regards to intensity, that's a great segue into a question we had from the audience. Uh, the question is, how were you able to combat burnout on your journey to knighthood? All right, here we are. Um, so my household does a great thing where we always take a month off in December and by that time you're kind of you're feeling the burnout sometimes if you're going to events every weekend and um, it's tough to give every Saturday up to a tournament or an event but um, I notice after December I'm really hurting like I, I've got to start fighting I truly love the sport so taking a little bit of time for yourself once in a while is great. Um, and it really shows you how much um, you love the sport. Do we have anybody else that would like to comment? All right, we're gonna switch back and we are featuring our hostess. All right, thanks for that, Vespa. So the next question we've got is from Carol Ann Smock Augusta in the Middle Kingdom. And she says, what does being a knight mean to you? So what being a knight means to me, um, I always think about um, something that I, I was heard that was attributed to uh, His Majesty Uther, current King of the West. Uh, and it was a quote that paraphrasing essentially went, uh, as a knight, you want for when you pass on to meet all of the knights of uh, the past, and when you see them, they will ask you, how does chivalry fare in your time? And you want to be able to say that chivalry fares well. Um, for me, being a knight is all about being able to uphold and represent that tradition, uh, to be able to be an example of chivalry to people coming up after you and to really try and uphold those values for people and for yourself. 
because in essence, chivalry is just a guideline on how to be a good person. So being able to be a part of that is really huge for me. Um, I can't describe how uplifting it really can be. Um, so I'm a triple peer. So I see peerages from different perspectives, uh, Laurel, Pelican, and Knight. Uh, the view people put on Knights, the spotlight, is much higher than it is on the other orders because I think because of the mythology behind the Middle Ages of what a knight is and what a knight is expected to be. So there's that aspect. Uh, there's the aspect as a peer of the SCA where you're expected to provide support and guidance to others uh, from my squire, for example, um, or to other fighters on the field. Now for me personally, uh, I'm externally motivated and not internally motivated. So I don't do things for me so much. I do things because it helps others or it makes my friends happy. And we've heard this from a number of the other panelists where you've got a lot of feedback from the women in the kingdom, the non-fighters, the girls, the young kids uh, who look to you as that inspiration of someday that can be me. And that's something that's in my head all the time. Um, to the point that I actually made it part of my elevation when I was elevated to the chivalry is I brought the girls of the kingdom, any girl, you know, not adult, uh, who wanted to be in the ceremony was allowed in and they escorted me into the, into the hall. And we had, I think, 15 or 16 kids there. And I was expecting one or two, you know, I thought, oh, that'd be kind of cool. Uh, and I had this crowd of kids behind me and I, I turned around and I saw them because they were behind me. I didn't see them. And I went, oh my God, <laughs> this is amazing. And this is, I wanted them there to be the next generation of fighters and for the kingdom to see what this meant to them. And uh, I think the parents, when they came back and they're, oh my God, my, my daughter was so happy. This was amazing. Thank you. Um, so there's that as well, is that not just as a knight, but as a female knight, you're being watched and not necessarily judged, but you're, I hate to say hero, but you are, and that's going to be in your head that I'm being expected to do this for these people to provide the role model for them to be themselves. All right, that awesome answer actually segues perfectly into our next question. Um, and so this comes from Signe in Atlantia, and she says, how did it feel when you went through that change in status after you were knighted? Sorry, technical issues. So when I was knighted, I don't know what I expected, but clearly I had some kind of expectation. Something would be different. And it wasn't, I was still just best. I was still just fighting, but I know that I felt restless. Like I'd had this goal, I want to be a good fighter. And now I'd had confirmation I was a good fighter and I didn't know, I didn't know what to do next. I sort of went, well, now I'm in the club and it's great and I like it, but, but what do I do? Uh, and, and that was really hard feeling a little bit lost. At that point, I, I set a different goal for myself. I was gonna win Coronet, which I did in six months. But it was feeling empty. It was not having a goal, not having a direction. Because I like goals and I like directions. Alfwin says she's motivated by external things. I'm motivated by internal things, internal goals. And that has always been um, a challenge for me. So after, after being elevated after Coronet, then my question was, well, now what? And my goal from then until this day has always been to be a good knight. And I can't tell you that I know exactly what a good knight is, but that is my goal. People, people cheered for me, and we've heard this before too. Before people would cheer for me, like you'd be the underdog and they'd be like, yay, best, you won that fight. And I'd be like, yeah, I won the fight, I'm terrific. And then after that, they'd be winning a fight, say, and people would say, I'd go, I want to fight. Isn't that terrific? And they'd say to me, well, you're a knight. You're supposed to win the fight. And then if I didn't, I'd be like, you're a knight. Why did you lose? 
So there were, there are changes that, that happen to you that you don't even know about. Um, expectations, as we've said, expectations of others change of you once you become a knight, even though you feel you're the same person. Um, so the coolest change that happened, um, and mine was recent in August, um, I was elevated. And the next weekend I went to a tournament. Um, and before, after a tournament, I would go get pickup fights, but I'd have to go stand out in the sun on the field. And the, the coolest change that I saw was before I was still in the tournament, we were a couple rounds in and I had four fights lined up for after the tournament. So that was really cool to, um, to be challenged in that way, to have fights afterwards. Um, yeah. All right, thanks for that. Um, so the next one we have is just a general question for all of the people in the panel. So we've got, do you have any words of wisdom after knighthood slash fighting excellence and what are they um so the only thing that's worth the blood and the sweat and the frustration of fighting is the joy of fighting um a belt and a chain are nice symbols but the joy of a great fight is what makes it worth it so take joy in your opponent honoring you by them taking the field and take joy that you're learning a really tough game um and, and that's what's going to make it worth the effort. So really similar sentiment. I think just love the art. Fight as many people as you can. Learn from whoever you can. Change things up when you need to. Uh, and one of the things that I cannot stress enough is be inspired by anyone possible. Um, certainly when I was coming up, there were no female knights in my area. We're all here if you need support, uh, but don't feel like you can only be restricted to being inspired by fighters that are physically like you. Um, even now, uh, my partner and I joke because I'll go to training and I go, I watched a video of Duke Thorf and I'm gonna fight like him today. And sometimes those are some of my best fights. So be inspired by absolutely anyone who sparks that joy in fighting for you. So this can be a very frustrating hobby sometimes. And this is the advice that I give to pretty much everybody. The SDA is a game and we play games for fun. So if you're not having fun, figure out why and then find the fun parts. Um, if you're having fun, like we've heard before, you'll be relaxed, you'll be enjoying yourself, you'll progress and everything else will follow from that. But if you set yourself goals that may or may not be attainable, then you're going to set yourself up for failure. So have fun, enjoy it, and, and everything else will follow. So this is a comment particularly for the female fighters. I am five foot four. This is a sport that favors big, tall, strong people, men or women, but most female fighters tend to be on the smaller side. Most female fighters I know, they'll get discouraged in the first couple of years if they and another guy join at the same time. The guy will surge ahead of her. Uh, he'll win a lot more fights because he's bigger and stronger and can hold a shield up longer or maybe can throw far more combinations than a woman can fight. Women need to learn technique. We, for the most part, and I know I'm generalizing, we're not gonna be throwing thousands of combinations. We need technique, we need accuracy, and those things take time. So if you're fighting and if you're in your first even two or three years and the guys are ahead of you, it's so easy to say, I'm not good at this and I'm gonna stop. But I would encourage you to stay, to work on your technique and you will find that in years four and up say, and again, that's an average, that you will not only catch up to the guys that you will exceed them because being big and strong can only take you so far. You need to have the technique as well. And the technique that you'll learn will also save you a lot of injuries in the future. So please stay past the second and third year. If you're loving it, but you're feeling discouraged, really focus on your technique and stay, stick with it. And I think you'll find that you'll enjoy it again. Um, so I'm gonna agree with everyone else and say, find your love for fighting. Don't get too discouraged 
we all love fighting and um, just remember that on the hard days or on the hard fights. Make sure you don't get discouraged when you lose because that's the best way to learn. We're going to switch over to our gallery view right now. We have a couple questions from the audience. Uh, question number one, before you were knighted, when you were a lower to mid-level fighter, how did you get perspective on your skill level? All right, we have, let's see, there we go. Um, I think one of the best ways uh, to analyze your fighting is to videotape yourself. Have somebody videotape you while you fight at practice or a tournament and really review it. You're going to be your harshest critic and you'll see things that you've been training and maybe made an error. So videotape every now and then and um, really analyze that with yourself or with somebody else. Thank you. All right. Do we have another comment regarding that? We are going to go ahead and move on then to our second question from the audience. Did you ever notice a change in someone's approach or their attitude once they realized that there was a woman under the armor that they were uh, when they were fighting? Um, if so, how did that make you feel? All right, here we go. Uh, so I read this one as it popped up on the screen, it made me laugh because I think uh, one of my favorite things is actually when somebody has a really good fight with me and they go, thank you, my Lord, and then wander off because I went, ha, they felt slightly intimidated by me, maybe. Uh, probably not. But at no point did they think that I was feeble. But I uh, have a funny story. I traveled to West Antier last year and uh, there was everybody knew that I was a female for the most part, but I was in this tournament. Uh, the cancer tournament and I was going through some rounds and it was funny because pretty much after every fight somebody else would would come over and like give me a, a nice compliment which is great but uh, it was funny because my male counterparts on the side of the field were looking and, and somebody nicely was like oh uh, you beat me in a fight here uh, you can borrow one of my benches to sit on and I was like cool awesome and uh, my partner and my knight were like nobody ever offers us anything when we kill them uh, and it's, it's interesting because you do sort of get probably some extra attention that I feel like your male counterparts don't get. And so that can be uh, strange in itself. But, uh, like I said before, that was actually one of my hurdles is I kind of had to accept that. I, I very much feel like, uh, we are a minority we're different but we're not necessarily special but i had to kind of get over that and go okay well you can feel that way thank you uh, and sort of take that attention graciously so when it happens you know you sort of roll with it you know you've at least made a positive impression on them um and yeah you move forward do we have any other comments regarding that oh we have two more all right so we're gonna start right in the middle for me So I think it's, well, first of all, Aldemar is a very king, very small kingdom. So everybody knows who and what I am. So I only notice these sorts of confusion, shall we say, when I go to other kingdoms, uh, especially Penzik. So Penzik, I don't very often have somebody who doesn't recognize that I'm female from the get-go. Uh, I definitely would get uh, harder times from, from people. Hey, why didn't you take that shot or not taking shots? Um, I have a, a funny story, I suppose. Uh, this poor water bearer, when Penzik came up and she was going down the line, I still had my helmet on and uh, she actually said, some water, my lady. And uh, then she looked down and saw the belt and went, oh, sorry, my Lord. And I went, no, 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 you don't need a penis to get one of these. And the poor woman went absolutely <laughs> beet red and we all started laughing. And then she realized that I was joking. So she laughed too. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a perspective when a male fighter sees a female fighter and there's an automatic assumption, oh, she's not going to be very good. And I'm embarrassed to admit it that I did it myself once and the lady kicked my ass and I deserved it. Um, so yeah, it's something that we do see, but it's, it's, it's part of the game, unfortunately, and you just kind of roll with it. And what I am very much happy about is talking to some of our younger female fighters going to places like Penzik and they're not getting anywhere near the sort of flack that I got when I first went back in the early 90s. So it's progressing, it's getting better, women are being accepted as 
fully functional uh, and competitive uh, combatants on the field. So good job. It's, it's good to see. So I have I have a story about that. Um, I was I was fighting at Penzik, and after the battles, um, my knight is like, "Hey, you should fight some pickups with this with this guy, this knight from somewhere in the south of the mid room." I'm sorry, I should probably remember his name. I don't. Um, so we fought nine foot spear pickups. Whatever, it was great. And this one shot is he he's throwing the shot. I saw it coming straight for my face, so I was trying to like back out of it, and it landed, but it landed really very politely. It was light, it was fine. Um, but I tripped over on my own feet and fell on my butt. And he was like there instantly. And he's like, I am so sorry, I'm so sorry. You know, my mama would totally kick my butt if he knew I was hitting girls. And I was like, I'm a fighter. What are you talking about? But it really highlighted that we all bring our own baggage in some ways. So. I try to give guys a pass sometimes when they say something stupid. Um, it's like, well, you know, that came from where you came from. It's not necessarily what you really would believe if you were thinking about it. Wonderful. Do we have anybody else that would like to comment? All right, I am passing this back over to our hostess. Thanks for that. Well, um, we've come to the end of our session. So we had an hour and we're three minutes over. So we're gonna wrap it up now. I know there was a few more audience questions. Um, we don't have time now, so we'll get to them hopefully next week. I just wanted to say a really big thank you to Vespa for being our producer. Um, without you, we probably wouldn't have been able to make this work. Um, thanks to our five nights. Um, I have found this really interesting and really inspiring myself. And it's just amazing what you can do with a bit of technology and a bit of force of will. So. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Um, your answers are really insightful, and I think they're going to be really beneficial to a lot of the people that watch being fighters or trainers um, who watch today. So next week, our episode is going to be themed armor, weapons, and training. And again, we'll have five panelists who will be on board for preset questions, um, but also a few from the audience. Um, before we wrap up, Vespa, can you just explain how people can find this as the recording? Ah, yes. Um, people can find this on the Known World Fighters page, but it is a public video. So by all means, feel free to share those as well in other areas. Um, it is possible that it may be uploaded to YouTube. And if that is the case, we will share that information as well to be passed out. Fantastic. Well, on that note, um, we're going to wrap up. Thanks everyone for participating. Thank you very much for watching. Have an awesome week and we'll see you next week. Thanks everyone, bye.